So let's continue our discussion of formal logic and we're going to transition now to truth tables which is going to be a checking procedure to tell if arguments are valid or not. So let's revisit this argument. We've talked about this argument or something like it. The first premise is if it's Friday my favorite TV show is on. Let's suppose that your favorite show is actually on today. Does that mean that it's Friday? Well, it doesn't, right? It may seem valid, but if you think about it, it's not. Because maybe your favorite show is on Monday through Friday. right? Maybe your favorite show is The Tonight Show, which I believe is on Monday through Friday nights. So it's true that if it's Friday, your favorite show is on, and your favorite show could be on, but maybe it's Monday or Tuesday. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's Friday. So how would you show or prove to someone that that argument is not valid? What would you have to do? I mean, you could sort of give a long oral explanation like I just gave, but in general, how would you do it? And what are you appealing to? It seems like we're just kind of appealing to our own subjective reason. We can kind of look at it and our brain gives us an answer. Well, sometimes our brain gives us the wrong answer because when we investigated this argument early on in the course, a lot of us mistakenly thought that this argument was valid when it's not. So it would be nice to have a test or a checking procedure to A, Give us an answer when we don't have one. Sometimes you'll get an argument and you just don't know if the conclusion follows. B, um, it gives us a way to check our answers when we think it's one way and maybe it turns out that it's not, etc. Okay, so we just answered these questions. So philosophers devised a formal method to show arguments are valid or invalid, and they're called truth tables. But to use these, we're going to have to symbolize English into sentence logic. So that's why we spent the last lecture learning how to do that. Because the truth tables, they only work in the language of sentence logic. They don't work in English. So that's why we learned how to translate English into sentence logic, because now we can use truth tables which will give us an answer to any argument we present to ourselves. We can use a truth table to figure out if it's valid or not. So how do truth tables work? Well, the first thing that we need to know to use them are the truth conditions for each of our connectives, for each of our sentence types, for our negations, conjunctions, disjunctions, conditionals and biconditionals. So let's start with the truth conditions for negations. It turns out negations have the opposite truth value of the statement they negate. Okay, let's take an example. Take the statement, Ryan lives in California. That's true, right? Well, let's say we symbolize that with C. The negation of this would be Ryan doesn't California or not C. Does that make sense? So if Ryan lives in California is C, Ryan doesn't live in California is not C. So now let's talk about truth values. Let's say you have a statement, uh, we'll call it P, and uh, if P is true, then what do you know about not P? Well, you probably guess that it's false, and that's correct. So if P is, um, turns out to be Ryan lives in California, which is true, then you know that if somebody said the opposite of that, if someone said, I don't live, so if someone said, hey, Ryan doesn't live in California, they would be asserting not P, and that would be a false statement. Well, what if P um, were the statement, Ryan lives in Florida, right? So in that case, P would be false and the negation of it would be true. So all you have to remember for negations is that the 
the truth value is the opposite. So if a statement is true, then its negation is false. And if a statement is false, then its negation is true. So it's just the opposite, as we would expect, right? And this is, uh, we've done, this is the truth table for negations. And it's called the characteristic truth table because it represents the truth table for all negations. All negations have this character when it comes to truth values. That's why it has the name. Okay, I hope that makes sense. Okay, so again, for any English statement that we symbolize, if we call it P, if P is true, then the opposite of it, or the negation, is false. And if P is false, then not P is true. All right, let's talk about conjunctions. In order for conjunctions to be true, both parts of the conjunction have to be true. And by the way, the parts of conjunctions are called conjuncts. So let's do another example. Let's say I promise to bring cake and ice cream to class. The only way for me to keep my promise is if I bring both. If I only bring the ice cream, or if I only bring the cake, or if I bring neither, God forbid, then I would be breaking my promise. So the only way for my promise to be true is if both parts of it, both parts of the and statement, turn out to be true. So let's suppose P means I bring cake and Q means I bring or brought ice cream. Consider these four cases. In the first case, I bring both the cake and ice cream. So P and Q is true. The conjunction, so the, I'm putting the truth value underneath the conjunction, underneath the, the connective, the main connective, and we'll talk about that in a second. There's only one connective here and it's the, and it's the main one. Since both of the parts of this and statement are true, the whole thing's true. Now consider another case. This is the world where I bring cake, but I don't bring ice cream. It's false that I bring ice cream. I broke my promise, and that's why P and Q is false. And similarly, maybe I bring the ice cream, but I don't bring the cake. So P is false, but, P is, but Q rather is true. I still I told a lie. My promise is false because I didn't come through with both. And of course, if I bring neither, then P and Q is false. So to, again, to reiterate, in the first case, I bring both cake and ice cream. So the statement P and Q is true. In the other three cases, I fail to bring the cake or the ice cream or both, which means I lied. So P and Q is false. So those are the truth conditions for conjunctions. What about or statements? What about disjunctions? Let's say my promise is a little bit different. It's a little bit weaker. Suppose I promise cake or ice cream. I say, guys, you know, I can't, I'm a teacher, I can't afford both. I'll bring, I'll bring one of them, but not both. I mean, I'll bring, I'll bring one or the other, like maybe I'll bring both, but um, I'll at least bring one or the other. But don't count on both. So as long as I bring one or the other or both, I keep my promise. So the only way, the only way I would lie, if I say I'll bring at least cake, I'll bring one of them, at least, cake or ice cream, then the only way that I'm a liar is if I bring neither. So the only way a disjunction, or remember that's a fancy term for an or statement, is false, is when both parts or the disjuncts are false. So the parts of conjunctions are conjuncts, the parts of disjuncts are, sorry, the parts of disjunctions are disjuncts. So let's look at this in a truth table. So we've got the statement P or Q and it's two parts. In the world where I bring both cake and ice cream, I kept my promise because I said I'd bring at least one of them, possibly both. That's what I meant by, uh, I, you know, uh, I'll bring cake or ice cream or both is really what my promise was. And if I bring, let's say I just bring the cake and I, it's false that I bring the ice cream. I still kept my promise. And if I don't bring the cake, but I bring the ice cream, so P is false, but Q is true, then my statement, P or Q, still holds because I brought one of them. It's only in the last case where I don't bring either. That's the only way I lied, is if I show up to class and I empty-handed. I would just say, sorry, I, uh, I guess I lied. So again, to reiterate, the statement P or Q is only false in the fourth case when P and Q are both false. Otherwise, 
your statement is true. Now let's talk about if-then statements, conditionals. The only way a conditional, remember that's an arrow statement, is false, is when the left side, the side to the left of the arrow, which is called the antecedent, is true. So you can see the root there, ante, for before. And the right side, which is known as the consequent, the consequences that follow, is false. So when the left side's true and the right side's false, that makes the arrow false. Otherwise, the arrow's always true. Let's do another example. Let's say I, I tell you all of you, and this is not real, this is hypothetical, unfortunately, but I say, if you get an A on the final, I'll give you an A in the course. So the only way I break that promise is if you get an A on the final and I don't give you an A in the course, right? Any other combination of circumstances, I kept my promise. So let's look at the truth table for the arrow. So we've got P arrow Q and the components P and Q. So this is the first case. This is the case where you get an A on the final and I give you an A in the course. Did I keep my promise? Of course I did. Now here's the one and only false case. This is the case where you get an A on the final, but you don't get an A in the course. So I lied. So P arrow Q is false. If we swap the order around, Let's say that it's false that you get an A on the final, but you end up getting an A on the course. Did I keep my promise? You might think I didn't, but it turns out that I did. Because notice, I didn't say, hey, this is the only way that you're going to get an A in the course. I said, here's A way. So you got an A in the course. You didn't get an A on the final, but you got an A in the course, maybe because you did well in all the other exams and quizzes, you participated, maybe you bribed me, maybe you threatened me. There could be lots of ways to get an A in the course. You just didn't get it the way of my promise. So I didn't break my promise because of that. And now here's the final case, which is a bit strange. So every part of the statement is false. The antecedent's false, the consequence false, but the statement turns out true. Now that's surprising because you might think, how can you get truth out of two falses or falsehoods? But it makes sense if you apply it to our example. This is the case where you don't get an A on the final and I don't give you an A in the course. So I still kept my promise. And that's why the statement P arrow Q is true. So to reiterate, in the first case, you ace the final and I give you an A in the course. So I kept my promise. In the second case, you ace the final, but I don't give you an A in the course. This is the only case where the statement P arrow Q is false. In the third case, you don't ace the final, but you still get an A in the course. I kept my promise because I didn't say the only way to get an A in the course is to ace the final. Perhaps you aced all the other exams. Maybe you participated in class a bunch or bribed me, threatened me, blah, blah, blah. And in the fourth case, even though everything's false, it's still true. You don't ace the final, so I don't give you an A. That makes sense, right? I kept my promise. I kept my end of the bargain. So the arrow statement is true. Okay, so that was the characteristic truth table for conditional statements represented by the arrow. And finally, we have the biconditional statements like if and only if. Let's say my example, I tweak it a little bit. I say, I change, I change my bargain. I say, you'll get an A in this course if and only if you get an A on the final. You'll get an A on the course if and only if you get an A on the final. So now what I'm saying is that if you get an A on the final, it's a way to get an A on the course, but it's the only way, right? So this is a stronger statement. So if we say P is you get an A on the course and Q is you get an A on the final, let's go through uh, the examples. So my promise of you get an A on the, you, sorry, my promise of you'll get an A in the course if and only if you get an A on the final can be symbolized this way, P triple bar or P tri bar Q. Now remember, if you're going to type this, you can just go ahead and use the equal sign if you can't figure out how to make the three lines, that's fine. So let's go through the truth table for the triple bar.
the, tr the, the try bar statements, they're true when both sides have the same truth value. They're false otherwise. So let's go through the four cases. So remember this, 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 the example statement is, you get an A in the course if and only if you get an A on the final. So in the first case, you get an A in the course and you got an A on the final. So that's consistent with my statement. In the second case, you get an A in the course, but you didn't get an A on the final. So how can that be? If I said it's the it's A way and only way, how did you get how did you get an A in the course if you didn't get an A on the final? So that must that must mean that my what I said wasn't correct. And similarly, if you got an A on the final but you didn't get an A in the course, then something's wrong with my deal. Because I said a way and the only way to get an A in the course is to get an A in the final. But you ended up with an A on the final, but you didn't get an A in the course. So something went wrong. So what I said must be wrong. It's false. And then similarly, if you didn't get an A in the course and you didn't get an A in the final, that's still consistent with what I said. And so uh, my statement is true. But in general, you just want to think, uh, notice in the first case, the truth values are the same. They're both true. And that makes the try bar true. And in the fourth case, they're both the same. They're both false. That makes the try bar true. And in the other two cases, the second and third, there's a mismatch. One true and one false or vice versa. And that makes the statement false. I think that's the easier way to think about it. But let's reiterate these cases again, because I think that was a little confusing, which I apologize for. So in the first case, you get an A in the course, and you get an A in the final. So that's consistent with what I said. I said it's A way and only way. In the second case, you get an A in the course, but you don't get an A in the final. So I lied, right? What I said wasn't true. I said it's A way and the only way. But you didn't get an A in the final. So how'd you end up with an A in the course? In the third case, you don't get an A in the course, but you got an A in the final. But I said getting an A in the final is A way and the only way to get an A in the course. So I lied. And the fourth way is consistent with what I said. You didn't get an A in the course, and you didn't get an A in the final. Because I said it's A way and an only way, so you didn't get an A in the final, so you're not going to get an A in the course. Okay. But again, to reiterate, when you're trying to figure out the truth conditions for the try bar, you want to look for sameness. If both sides are true, then the statement's true. If both sides are false, then the statement's true. It's when there's a mismatch. When one side's true and the other side's false or vice versa, that makes it false. Okay, we're almost ready to do truth tables, but before we do that, we have to practice finding the main connective. So remember, in our artificial language, the, which is named sentence logic or sentential logic, which also is called propositional or truth functional logic, lots of names. We have, what, what is the language comprised of? Well, there are atomic sentences, which are represented by capital letters, A, B, C, all the way to Z, and our five connectives, negation, and, or, the arrow for if, then, and the try bar. So what's the main connective? The main connective is the one that applies to the entire statement. So let's practice a little bit. Here's a statement. Not P and Q. Not P and Q. So there are two connectives in this statement. There's the and and there's the not. So which of them is the main connective? Well, it's the one that applies to the whole statement. It can't be the and because the and only applies within the parentheses. It's got to be the negation. The negation negates the rest of the statement. It applies to the whole rest of the statement. So the negation is the main connective. How about this statement? P and not Q. Again, two connectives, an and and a not. Which is the main connective? This time, it's the and. It can't be the not because the not only applies to Q. 
What's the symbol that applies to the whole statement? It's the ampersand, so it's got to be the and. How about this statement? Not P or not R. Now we have three connectives. So which is the main connective? Is it the first knot? Is it the second knot? Or is it the or? Is it the wedge? It turns out that it's the wedge. Again, it can't be either of the negations because the negations only apply to P and R respectively. The only connective that applies to the whole statement is the wedge. So that's the main connective. And how about this statement? P, arrow, and then in parentheses, R and not S. Again, three connectives, which is the main one? Is it the ampersand? No, that only applies within the parentheses. Is it the negation? No, that only negates the S. It's the arrow. That applies to the whole statement. That's the main connective. How about this statement? P arrow Q in parentheses, if and only if, that's the tri bar, not R. Here we have three connectives. Is it the arrow? No. The arrow only applies in the parentheses. Is it the negation? Uh-uh. That only applies to R. It's got to be the tri bar because that applies to the whole statement. Notice the left side of the tri bar is an arrow statement and the right side is a negation. And that's fine. So it's a, it's a complicated or a compound or complex or molecular <coughs> statement. So the capital letters, they're atomic sentences or atomic statements. And then if you have a, um, and then you could have a negated atomic sentence. And then you could have what's called a molecular sentence. And that has at least one of the connectives and or arrow or tri bar. And finally, this statement, four connectives, two negations, one arrow, one tri bar. Which one is the main one? Is it the arrow? No, that only applies within the parentheses. Is it the negation? No, that just applies to the R. Well, I mean, sorry, is it the second negation? No, that only applies to the R. Is it the triple bar? No, that only applies within the brackets. It's got to be the first negation. That applies to the whole statement. So notice here, we have a negated if and only if statement. The left side of the if and only if statement is an arrow statement. The right side is a negation. Okay, so um, we need three things to use the truth table, which is a formal way to show arguments are valid or invalid. Number one, actually four things. Number one, we have to be able to translate English into sentence logic. So we did that last time. Two, we had to talk about the truth conditions for each of the connectives. Three, you have to figure out what the main, be able to uh, have the ability to find the main connective. And four, we have to recall our definition of validity and invalidity. So here's the definition of a valid argument. An argument is valid if and only if. So here's a way and the only way if it's impossible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. And so this entails a definition of invalidity. In our, you can probably figure out what it is. An argument is invalid if and only if it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So we're actually going to use truth tables to show that arguments are invalid because they're really quick and fast at doing this. And we're going to learn another method next time that's a quick and fast way for proving arguments valid. But for now, we're just going to use truth tables to show um, arguments are invalid. Even though it is the case that you can show an argument to be valid with a truth table. <clears throat> All right. So with these four things, again, symbolization, truth conditions, finding the main connective, and definition of invalidity, we're finally in a place to use the formal method that philosophers came up with as a checking procedure to tell if an argument is invalid. Let's do it. I'm excited. Are you? Let's revisit our argument that we know is invalid. If it's Monday, my favorite show is on. My favorite show is on, thus it's Monday. So I think I changed the day to, from Friday to Monday, but that's fine. We know that that doesn't matter. 
All right, so first we have to symbolize the argument. That's why we had to practice all of that last time because to use this test, we need to first symbolize, and that's why I had to teach you how to do that. So the first premise, if it's Monday, my favorite show is on. We could symbolize that like this, M arrow S. So what does M stand for? Think about that. If you think it's Monday, that's actually incorrect. Remember, the capital letters are atomic statements or sentences, and they have to be complete sentences with a subject and a predicate. So M doesn't just stand for Monday. It has to stand for the complete statement, it is Monday, or today is Monday, or it is the case that it's Monday, something like that. And S doesn't stand for TV show or favorite TV show. It has to stand for my favorite TV show is on. Second premise, my favorite show is on, which would be represented by S. And the conclusion is M. Okay, so we symbolize the argument. Easy enough. Now what? Now we're going to write the argument, argument out from left to right, like this. Okay, so we've got premise 1, M, arrow S, premise 2, which is S, and the conclusion, which is M. Then we're going to find the main connective of each premise and put a T underneath. And if the statement is atomic, then we'll just put a T underneath it. Like this. Okay? So the first premise has a connective. There's only one, so it's obviously the main connective. So we're going to put a T under it. And the second premise is atomic, so we'll just put a T underneath it. Now we have to put an F underneath the main connective of the conclusion. And if there isn't one, then just put it under the atomic sentence. Like this. So what we're doing is we are assuming that both the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Now recall the definition of invalidity. By definition, an argument is invalid if it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. So we're going to assume that this is possible, and if we can back that up, then we've proven that the argument is invalid. But notice to do this, we had to be able to symbolize. We needed the definition of invalidity. We needed to be able to find the main connective, and now we're going to use those truth conditions. So it's a pretty complicated process, but I think you're on it now. <clears throat> now we have to ask ourselves, what do we know? What do we know? Well, look, S in the second premise is is true, right? So that means that S in the first premise also has to be true. Has to be, we have to be consistent. You know, S can't be true in one place and false in another. That would be crazy. So we're going to go ahead and put a T under the S. So it looks like it missed a little bit, but that should be right under the S. And we know that M is false from the conclusion. So that must mean that the M in the premise has got to be false. All right, so again, here's the argument with those truth values. So once we've done this, what we have to do is check two things. Number one, we have to make sure that we're consistent with the truth values underneath the sentence letters, right? So there are two sentence letters, M and S. So everywhere M appears, is it false? Yes. Everywhere S appears, is it true? Yes. So, so in other words, M has the same value everywhere it appears, and since it's false in one case, it needs to be false in all the other cases. The second thing we have to do is make sure the values underneath the connectives are consistent with what we know about their truth conditions. And this does work because we know that the only way the arrow should have an F under it is if the left side's true and the right side's false. I just taught you that, right? But we don't have that here. We have the left side false and the right side true. So underneath the arrow, there should be a true. So that is right. So again, to remind us of what that might mean in our example, this is the case where you don't get an A on the final, but you get an A on the course, in the course. That's consistent with my promise because I didn't say it was the only way. So my promise is still true. Under the arrow, we get a true. <clears throat> and so look what we've done. We have proven, we've shown that it's possible for the premises to be true and the conclusion false. It happens when S is true 
and m is false. So by definition, this argument is invalid. We've literally shown that it's possible for the premises to be true while the conclusion false. So by definition, it's invalid, and we've proven it. It's pretty cool. Okay, let's try another one. Let's show that this argument is invalid. So um, if this were in English, the first thing we would have to do is symbolize it. That's why I taught you how to do that. Then we would write it out from left to right, like we did here. So write it out horizontally. And now do you remember what to do next? We have to put a T underneath each premise. So if it's atomic, it goes right under. And if it's not, then we'll put a T underneath the main connective. So there's a little extra space after the arrow there, and um, I hope that doesn't confuse you. But um, let me just go through the premises and the conclusion. Premise one is not P and Q, and the main connective of that is the negation. So we'll put a T under that. The second premise is in parentheses P and R, arrow S. The third premise is just S. And then the conclusion is P or not R. So I have these three dots here. It's just a symbol for therefore, which I think I've taught you before. So we're going to put a T underneath the main connective of each premise. So there's a T underneath the main connective of premise 1 which is the negation. There's a T underneath the arrow, which is the main connective of premise 2. There's a T underneath the S. It's just kind of drifted there. And then we have to put an F underneath the main connective of the conclusion. So the F drifted, unfortunately. When I opened this up to re make the recording, it didn't quite come out right. So, that, so be, let's be clear right here. The F should be right underneath that wedge. And it's underneath the P, but it should be under the wedge. So I apologize for that. Now we ask ourselves, what do we know? Well, the S in the third premise is true. So that means that the S in the second premise has to be true. So we put a little T underneath the S. And it drifted a little bit, but that's okay. What else do we know now? Well, the conclusion, the wedge is false. There's only one way that a wedge can be false. That's when both parts are false, right? If I promised cake or ice cream and I lied, the only way it could be a liar is if I bring neither. So that means for any wedge statement, if it's false, both parts have to be false. So now we put an F underneath the P, which drifted a little bit to the left. And this other F is underneath the, um, the negation of the R, which also drifted a little bit, and I apologize. So if P is false in the conclusion, it's got to be false in premise 1 and premise 2. And notice that um, if not R is false, then what do we know about R? It's got to be true. So this T should be underneath the R, which means that the R in the second premise has to be true, right? And what do we know about the AND statement in the second premise, P and R? The only way an AND statement can be true is if both parts are true. If I promise cake and ice cream, I need to bring both to keep my promise. But in this case, I only bring one of them. I only bring the ice cream. So that AND statement is false. And I also know that the AND statement in the first premise is false for two reasons. Because the left side is false. So I already, even without knowing what Q is, I know that the AND is going to be false because the left side's false, right? It's like if I promise cake and ice cream and I show up and... Um, I'm all, I, I tell you, you know what, I didn't, bring, I didn't bring cake. You already know that I lied, even if I, even if I bring ice cream. And we also know the and is false in premise 1 because um, 
Premise one is the negation of this and statement, right? And the negation is true. So what it is negating has to be false. It's negating the ampersand. So if the negation is true, what it's negating has to be false. And that's why we put an F under, that's another reason to put an F under the ampersand in premise one. Does it matter what the value of Q is? It doesn't. Either way, there's only one Q in this whole argument. Either way, if you make Q true or you make Q false, it's going to come out correct. So there are actually multiple correct answers here. All right. So um, now we have to do those two things. We need to, number one, make sure that we're consistent with the atomic sentence values. So in premise one, let's look at P. It's false. Is it false everywhere it appears? It's false in premise two, and it's false in the conclusion. Check. What about Q? Q is true in premise one, and it doesn't appear anywhere else, anywhere else, so that's fine. What about R in premise two? It's true. Is it true everywhere else? Yeah, it shows up in the conclusion, and um, it's true. So that again, that T should be directly underneath the R. And finally, what about S? Is S the same everywhere it appears? Yes, it's true everywhere it appears. Okay, now let's check the connectives. Let's start with premise one. Well, inside the parentheses, the AND is false. Is that right? Yes, because um, the left side of the AND, of the ampersand, is false. So that's going to make the AND false, even though the right side's true. And then negation negates a statement that's false, so the negation is true. Good. Now premise two. Let's start with inside the parentheses. Well, we have an AND statement. The left side's false, the right side's true. So the AND statement, the ampersand, is false because the only way it would be true if both parts were true, but that's not the case. We have a, uh, one part false, so the AND is false. Okay, the and, uh, the, under the AND, the value underneath the AND represents the truth value of the left side of this horseshoe statement of premise two. In other words, the antecedent. The antecedent is false. And the right side, the consequent of this is S. And that is true. So the T should be directly under that S, but it's not. Again, I apologize. So we have an arrow statement. The left side's false, and the right side's true. And that is correct, that the arrow would be true. Because remember, the only way the arrow is false, hopefully this is a mantra that you're going to start to memorize because you repeat it so much. The only way the arrow is false is if the left side's true and the right side's false. But that doesn't happen in this premise. The left side is false and the right side is true. Again, the English example is this is a case where you don't get an A on the final, but you get an A in the course. And that's consistent with my promise because I didn't say it's the only way to get in the course, it's A way. So that arrow would get it true. All right, the premise three is true by definition. And the conclusion is false. And this works because it's a wedge statement and um, which means it's a wedge statement that's false, which means the only way this can happen is if both parts are false, and they are, right? There should, <coughs> there should be a P underneath, or sorry, there should be an F underneath the P, underneath the wedge, and underneath the negation. And if you kind of slide those over just a little bit to the right, that's what's going to happen. And um, so both parts of the wedge are false because the left side is P, which is false, and the right side of the wedge statement is not R. And the main connective of not R is the negation, and the value of that connective is false. Okay, even though there's a T directly underneath it, again, it should be an F. So you should slide those four values just a little bit over to the right, and that'll fix everything. So the main connective of the right side is false, the main connective of the left side is false, so the wedge is false. And um, R is true because the negation of R is false. So we've done the two things. Again, what we had to do is make sure that all the values have, um, every instance of P has the same value, which it does, every instance of Q, every instance of R, etc., and then check the connectives. And then we've shown a case where it's, the premises are all true, the main connectives of the premises are all true, 
and the conclusion is false. So by definition, this argument is not valid. The conclusion does not follow from the premises. It's just, it's, it's like if I said, oh, you live in Hollister, therefore you must speak Chinese, or therefore you live in Santa Clara County. That doesn't follow, right? Those are invalid arguments. This similarly, similarly, this conclusion does not follow from the premises. And what's cool is we have a mathematical formal way to prove that. We've given a case where the premises are true and the conclusion is false. Namely, when P is false, Q is true or false, doesn't matter. R is true and S is true. So what I want you to do is to practice these on your own. And remember, you need the four things, symbolization, truth conditions, find the main connective, and the definition of invalidity. Here, these are already translated for you, so you don't have to symbolize, but you're going to have to use the truth conditions, the definition of invalidity, and you're going to have to be able to find the main connective. So these are four arguments. Uh, um, uh, uh, in the four bullet points written out already from left to right. So find the main connectives of the premises, put T's underneath them, find the main connective of the conclusion, put an F. Again, if there's no connective, just put it right underneath. And then ask yourself, what do you know? Right? So in the first one, you would know that H is false because you're supposed to put a T underneath the main connective of the premise, which is the negation. So H has to be false, which means the, ace, the, sorry, the H in premise 1 has to be false. And you know that the negation in front of that K is going to be false, because it's the main connective of the conclusion. So K has got to be true. So the K in the first premise has to be true. And that arrow is going to end up being true, because the left side is false and the right side is true. In the second one, B is going to be true, it's a premise. A is going to be false because it's the conclusion. And so the A and B in the first premise are going to match up to that. And the arrow is going to be true because the left side is false and the right side is true. So you might want to pause here and try them on your own. I'm just kind of going through the answers um, that, I, that I want you to do. Um, I want you to try these on your own and then kind of listen to this as I kind of verbally go through the answers. In the third one, there's only one premise, so that's a little bit different. The main connective of that premise is the arrow, and the main connective of the conclusion is also the arrow. So in the premise, you're going to put a T under it. In the conclusion, you're going to put an F underneath it. So um, I told you there's only one way to put an F underneath an arrow. So in the conclusion, we know the left side has got to be true and the right side's got to be false. So we know L is true. So that means the L in premise 1 has to be true. And we know that the and on the right side is false. Okay, what else do we know? Well, if we want the first premise to be true, and we know that uh, L is true, then um, what do we know about the left side? Do we know that it's true? Do we know that it's false? We don't. So at this point, we just have to pick something. So sometimes there's a little bit of guess and check to these. So let's assume that the, um, the left side of the first premise, of the only premise, is true. So we'll, make the, we'll put a T underneath the AND, which means that H and K are both true. And that would work because that would mean that K and H in the conclusion would also be true. And we would have, and then if you went through those two things, if you checked all of the atomic sentences, they would be consistent, and the the main connective values would work too. The first premise would be true because the left side's true and the right side's true, and the conclusion would be false because the left side's true and the right side. Oh, did I, I might have screwed that one up. Let's see. No, no, no. We don't want. That's right, we don't want K and H to be true because we need K and H to be false. So we need one of those to be false, that's right. I'm getting a little mixed up because I'm trying to just do all this in my head. But you're going to have the advantage of doing this on paper. That's right. So K and H has to be false. So that means that one of them 
at least has to be false. So um, we could make them both false. I think that would work. So if k and h are both false, then the and would be false, and the right side of that conclusion would be false, but L is true, so that would make the conclusion false overall. And then the premise would still be true because, yes, this would work. The ampersand statement is false because both parts are false, and the arrow would be true, and uh, L is true because F arrow true is still true. So that would be the way to do it. You don't want to make H and K true. That's what I thought for a second. But one way to do it would be to make them both false. And then finally, in the last one, we put a T underneath the wedge in premise 1, a T underneath the arrow in premise 2, a T underneath R, an F underneath the negation in the conclusion. So we know R is true. We know N is false because the negation of N is... Sorry, sorry. We know N is true because the negation of N is false. I apologize for that. So R and N are both true which means that premise one will be true because the left side's true and the right side's true. And then we know, uh, what would L be? Let's see, if N is true and we want the arrow to be true, then it doesn't matter what L is. It could go either way. So there you go. So we've, we've got four arguments and we've proven that they're all invalid, which is pretty cool. So again, the moral of all of this story, I know this is getting kind of mathy and symbol some of you might not like it. Some of you are like, wow, this is so awesome. But kind of the, the moral of all this, the point is that we what we can do, the sort of cash value, the takeaway, is going back to that argument I gave the first week. Um that went like, if it's uh, Friday, my favorite show is on, my favorite show is on, so it's Friday. That's sort of a confusing argument. And, you know, tell it to your friends and family. See if they can figure it out. It turns out that that argument is invalid. But some of us will think that it's valid, and we could argue about it. But now we have a way to check our answer. And if we don't have an answer, we have a way to get an answer. Right? And we have a way to show people what that answer is. So that's the value of this. So when arguments are trickier, when they get long and complicated, we can map them out and get the answer that we want. And what's cool is this isn't, you know, we are rational by nature. We have some logic wired into our brain. But this process, humans had to invent this. Philosophers invented this. It didn't come written in stone tablets that we dug up. We had to figure this out. And now we're passing it along, and I pass it along to you. And um, we, we are bombarded with arguments all the time. There could be an argument in a presidential debate. There could be an argument with a loved one. You could have an argument in a court case. There could be an argument in a contract. If you're, reading a, if you're buying a cell phone, they have those long contracts. And now, theoretically, if you wanted to, you could use this to, to map out the argument and see if the conclusion really does follow. This is why, if you're planning on being an, an attorney, studying logic is really important because one of, uh, one of the roles attorneys plays is to read, write, and understand contracts. And understanding the logical relationship of our language can be very difficult, but when we learn how to formalize this language, we can see more clearly the logic. And it, it, so you might not use this directly, but just kind of practicing this will make your, when, you out, when you're out in the world and you're just, and, and you're trying to figure out the logic of anything, you'll be better at it because you, you, because you practice so much in this formal way. <clears throat> okay, thanks for listening. Sorry for the long one. And um, you know, if you want more practice ones, just send me an email and uh, I'll, I'll give you more. By the way, uh, your textbook has some examples of these. What we actually did is called the short truth table. So the longer version, I'm actually going to skip over because I think it's too hard to uh, to do or be too. Maybe I could do it, teach it in these kind of online format, but um, but I just wanted to kind of cut out some of it because it would be too too much, I think. So this is what what I've taught you is the short truth table method to determine invalidity. All right, thanks for listening.